Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know by now, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. For the second quarter, that would be the months of April, May, and June of 2014. And this particular series is entitled Christ and His Law. And this is the last lesson, lesson number 13 in that series. And it's entitled Christ's Kingdom and the Law, and it's the lesson for June 28th of 2014. I hope you have your Bible handy because there's a lot of very significant verses here that we need to look at. And several things from Ellen White, of course, who was one of the founders of our church. Some things to think about from her as well. So now that you've got Bible in hand, let's bow our heads and ask God to guide us as we think together. Our wonderful Father, as we seek to understand you better, we come now to this lesson which talks about your final group of people at the end of this world's history. What kind of people will they be? How can we be that kind of people? How can we help to bring this whole great controversy to a conclusion? It's hard for us to imagine that this year it will be 170 years since the great disappointment. How much longer are you going to have to wait? We know it, that we're not waiting for you, you're waiting for us, as Peter spells out so clearly in Second Peter 3. Be with us now as we open these words of your holy word, that we may understand them and we may come to know them better and know you better, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in this lesson, we will explore the ultimate reason, the ultimate purpose, even the ultimate role of God's law throughout eternity. So, let's, let's see if we have some words that will spell that out. This is from Christ's Object Lessons, page 315. God requires perfection of his children. His law is a transcript of his character, and it is the standard of all character. This infinite standard is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to the kind of people whom God will have to compose his kingdom. The life of Christ on earth was a perfect expression of God's law. And when those who claim to be children of God become Christ-like in character, they will be obedient to God's commandments. Then the Lord can trust them to be of the number who shall compose the family of heaven. Now that ought to give us some thoughts, some scary thoughts, huh? We need God can trust them. That means God is not going to be populating the new earth with uh, people that are unwilling to learn and take instruction. That's what no. obedience means to listen, yeah. and to listen means to take instruction. And, uh, mm -hmm. Well, let me look at another passage, which is similar. This one is taken from the Signs of the Times, November, 8, November 17, 1898. In the gift of God's dear Son, a definite view of his character had, has been given to the race that is never absent from his mind. His very heart is laid open in the royal law. That infinite standard is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to that kind of people God would have compose his kingdom. It is only those who are obedient to all his commandments who will become members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king. These will be honored with a life, I'm sorry, with a citizenship above, a life that measures with the life of God. Imagine that. A life without sorrow, pain, or death throughout eternal ages. Wow. And so what's the standard God has set for people to be citizens of that kingdom? Perfection. His law. Perfection. Perfection. She said, she said yeah. it's got to be perfect. Yeah. It requires. Yeah. So how do we do that? But wh what does do we that do it mean? in our own power? What does that mean, though? What, how do, what does perfection look like? Perfection is a, is a word that, I don't know where it comes from in English. I know what the Greek comes from. The Greek word means mature. It means grown up. Well, when we use perfection here, like in mathematics, it's the exact number. 
Yeah, but this isn't this isn't a study in meth. But why wouldn't why would they use that number if if people are that actually? Word you mean? Yeah, why would they use that word if um, people are hearing it that way? Well, because it meant something very different to those people back in those days than it means to us now. But Remember, the Gospels were not written in English. Well, that's true, but that's my and point. Cer certainly why not in did 21st the translators, century. Why did the translators use the word perfection? And why does Ellen White use the word perfect? Well, because when she uses perfect, I mean, she looks at a flower and I, it's I think perfect. There's, I think, yeah, I think there's a very good reason why she uses that word. What she said, well, w what if she'd said, you know, and uh, if you want to get into the kingdom of heaven, you need to be 75% good. Well, isn't, well there another word? isn't there another word besides perfect? <laughs> because to me, nothing's perfect except God. Yeah. And then we're required to be God. That's, that's what I'm getting out of it. Yeah. It pointed and in it the right direction. Well, I know, but it's, it's, the way she said it, like it's, it's, that's required. Perfection is required. Mm -hmm. There's no standard. Uh, perfection is, there's nothing lower than perfection. The standard, the role, the model, the model has always been the life of Christ. Back of that up and a little perfect. bit. Could you, the, the, that text there, was a, perfect, was a perfect obedience? Is that the, is that the God word? God requires perfection of his children. Okay. His law is a transcript of his own character. Do we want them with only one lung or, or, yeah. or, or, or just, or part of their body parts missing? No, we, I mean, it's a, it's a, is it an offer? It's, a, it's something that you're offered, well, and not something you can conjure up or, or okay. do on your own. Let's look at the law itself and see what we can learn okay. from it. We see that there are lots of, in, in, look at the last six, for example. There are rules about honoring your parents, about killing, about committing adultery, about lying, against, about stealing. And what does r number 10 say? Wanting something that doesn't belong to you. Number 10 says we can't even want to do something wrong. Right. So the perfection he's talking about here that's, that's spelled out in the law means the only people God can admit to heaven are the ones who don't even want to do something wrong. Right. That's the perfection she's talking about. They don't even don't want, want to do to. something wrong. They, they recognize the truth about, of God's word and they, they want to live that way. They, they look at the life of Jesus and they are so attracted by looking at the life of Jesus they want to live that. Doesn't mean they will be able to, that they never make any mistakes. I mean, look at Romans 7 and Paul's experience. It means that they look at the life of Christ and they say, I want to be like that. Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah. It's just that when, when you, you read that statement, I start thinking that God requires me to be as good as God. Yeah, well, I mean, no, that's not what it means. I mean, yeah, I know, but uh, it needs to be explained. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. He expects well, us to do the spade work for ourselves. Yeah. Right? We've got our part here. Yeah. When Adam and Eve sinned, who claimed to be in, in charge of this world? Satan. 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 On what basis does he make that claim? Well, a good, good portion of the people <laughs> listen to him. <laughs> why, why do people listen to him? What, what is, what is the, the, the flag, the flagship idea of Satan's kingdom. Live for yourself. Self-centeredness. Selfishness. Selfishness. What's the flagship of God's kingdom? Other-centeredness. Love. Love. Live for others. Okay, look around you. You see how, how many people in the world do you see really living for others? How many people do you see living for themselves? The vast majority. <laughs> so what Satan has accomplished the reason he's gotten to where he is is because he's convinced us, he's convinced the human population that they would rather be like him than to be like God. So how do we fix that problem? Remember, that Satan actually asked Jesus Christ to kneel down to him. Yeah. Yes. To kneel down to him. He says, I will give you the world. I mean, as if he had the, if he had the ability to give it. Oh, well, he offered him a shortcut. Yeah. <laughs> you think it would have worked? Talk about it. Well, if, yeah. if, if, say that Jesus did 
bow to a, down to him, which I don't even want to think about. But, mm -hmm. but um, he could then back off and then give everything back to him. But he's bowed down to Satan, yeah. the thing that he wanted the most. Well, I would like us to think. Now, now it's very clear. Let's make this very clear. The great controversy is not over power. Satan thinks about God's power and what happens? Trembles. He trembles. Genesis, uh, James 2.19, 2, I'm sorry. Romans 8.3, at the last phrase of that verse says, Jesus needs to do what? He, needs to, he came to this earth to deal with sin or concerning sin or to take away sin. How does he do that? Teaches, demonstrates. The ultimate question in the great controversy is, who is telling us the truth. the truth? So the life and death of Jesus tells us what? The truth about God. So do we believe Satan's claims or do we believe what's revealed through the life and death of Jesus? Well, look back in the Old Testament. Look at Daniel 2, 44. We, we know Daniel, what's the story of Daniel 2? There was that giant image, Statue. and there was the head of gold, and that was Babylon. Then there were chest and, and arms of silver, and that was Medo-Persia. And then there was the belly and thighs of brass, and that was Greece. And then there was the legs of iron, that's Rome. And then there was the feet of iron and clay, and that's the nations that we have today, the nations that, we have today that can't seem to stick together. But then something happens. So what happens at the end? Well, look at verse 44. At the time of those rulers, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom that will never end. It will never be conquered, but will completely destroy all those empires and then last forever. How many of the other predictions in this chapter have come true? That is all done. Did, did God fail in any single prediction? No. No? What are the chances that that prediction is going to be true? 100%, right? Good. <laughs> Gary, you wanted something perfect. There's a perfect prediction. <laughs> Do we believe those words? Yes. Yeah. Well, if you read a bunch of places in the Bible, I'll just mention some verses. Well, let's just look one. 1 Peter 2, verse 11. What does God say about the people who don't want to live his way? I appeal to you, my friends, as strangers and refugees in this world. Do not give in to bodily passions which are always at war against the soul. So what's the relationship between God's true people and the rest of the world? No. They give in to bodily passions. Well, but no, what, but earlier than that, what did it say? We are as strangers and refugees in this world, right? Yes. Our, our citizenship, citizenship is not here, right? Our citizenship is not here. Look at Hebrews 11, verse 13. Let's try one more. It was in faith that all, remember, faith 11, Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. It was in faith that all these persons died. They did not receive the things God had promised but from a long way off, they saw them and welcomed them and admitted openly that they were foreigners and refugees on earth. What's our relationship to, the, to Satan's kingdom? Foreigners. Foreigners and refugees. Okay? So only people who keep God's law, and if we went on to read the rest of those verses, only those who keep God's law will be among the remnant. Remember Revelation 12, 17 and 14, 12? Those verses that every Adventist should have memorized. When we choose to become a part of God's kingdom, we must turn our back on the ruler of this world. What did Jesus say about him? Famous verses in John 12, verses 31 and 32. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. What was about to happen that would overthrow the ruler of this world? Jesus. Death. Jesus is going to go through that absolutely incredible experience of being tortured and dying. When I am lifted up, he says, that's exactly what he's talking about, I will draw everyone to me. And suffering this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to suffer. 
And what are we learning from that death? Well, in the great controversy, God is only a couple of weapons. What are God's weapons? Love. Love and truth. And those lo that love and that truth are demonstrated, especially in the life and death of Jesus Christ. Now, what weapons does Satan use? Deception, extortion. Force, misrepresentation, fear, torture, deception, lying, I mean, on and on and on. Any, anything like that that he can, any method he can possibly use to deceive us, to misrepresent God, he will use it. Does that sound like a fair war? Love and truth versus all that stuff? Well, they say truth will out, truth will ultimately prevail. Well, notice these words. This is what Ellen White says things were like when Jesus came to this earth. It's in Desire of Ages, page 22, first paragraph. The earth was dark through misapprehension of God. What was the problem? They misunderstood God, right? So how, are you going to so how do you solve a misunderstanding problem? Bring some truth and light. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. Satan can no longer deceive people who know the truth. This could not be done by force. How often has the church tried to use force? Hmm? The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only a service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. If it could be won by force or authority, who would have won the great controversy Satan. on day one? Satan. Well, no, not really, because... If that was a way to work, I mean, God has the power. God could have said, love me, and then we would just have to. That would solve the problem, right? But if God is love, he couldn't do it that way. Exactly. That's the thing. I mean, it's because it's contrary to his character. Exactly. Yeah. Well, look at a couple more verses. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. Surely you know that the wicked will not possess God's kingdom. Do not fool yourselves. People who are immoral or who worship idols or are adulterers or homosexual perverts or who steal or are greedy or are drunkards or who slander others or are thieves, none of these will possess God's kingdom. Some of you were like that, but you have been purified from sin. You have been dedicated to God. You have been put right with God by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Okay? So, these verses in Revelation 20, well, we should read that one. Look at Revelation 22 as well. Happy are those who wash their robes, uh, and there's some argument about whether this should read, wash their robes, just change a couple of letters and it be, it's keep, keep the commandments. Wash their robes clean and so have the right to eat the fruit from the tree of life and to go through the gates into the city. But outside the city are the perverts, those who practice magic, the immoral and the murderers, those who worship idols, those who are liars, both in words and deeds. In other words, who is inside the city? The faithful followers of Jesus, right? Who's outside the city? Everybody else, right? No one who is immoral, indecent, or a sinner will enter there. The wicked are shut out of heaven by their own choice. I want to make that very clear by this quotation from Steps to Christ, page 81, written by Ellen White, the founder of the SDA Church. It is no arbitrary decree on the part of God that excludes the wicked from heaven. They are shut out by their own unfitness for its companionship. The glory of God would be to them a consuming fire. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. And what does Revelation 6 say? Well, what's going to happen at the, second, at the second advent? What are the wicked going to be doing? Cry for the rocks and the mountains. Crying, Crying for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them to hide them from the face of, of God. Right? Mm -hmm. Surely none of us would deny the fact that God created a perfect world. We cannot imagine a better environment in which to live than the Garden of Eden. 
But when sin entered, what happened? Our world was severely damaged. Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden. So what really happened there? We lost our knowledge, appreciation, and love for the character of God because we believed Satan's misrepresentations. The only solution to this problem is to investigate for ourselves until we learn the truth and come to once again appreciate the truth about God's law and his character and agree to live accordingly. Think we could relearn the truth about God? Well, it's going to take a long time, probably, but we've got to start somewhere. Boy, it's time for us to get on with it, I would say. Well, we'll if sin is finally eliminated, say at the second coming, will it ever arise again? No. No. One would definitely hope not. Look at a couple of verses. Daniel 7:27. The power and greatness of all the kingdoms on earth will be given to the people of the supreme God. Their royal power will never end, and all rulers on earth will serve and obey them. Their royal power will do what? Right. Never end. And look at Revelation 21, verse 4. This is a famous verse. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. Now, the Bible in a number of places says that sin leads to death. If there's going to be no more death, it means what? Sin is wiped out. No more crying, no more pain. No, no more sin. Well, look at these very significant words from Great Controversy, page 499. Satan's rebellion was to be a lesson to the universe through all coming ages. A perpetual testimony. What does perpetual mean? Lasting forever. Continual. To the nature and terrible results of sin. The working out of Satan's rule, its effects upon both men and angels, would show what must be the fruit of setting aside the divine authority. So if somebody in the future tries to set aside the divine authority, what happens? I've often suggested a hypothetical situation. If someone in a future world that was created by God to decide that, well, why do I have to do things God's way? I'm going to do it my way. God could tap him on the shoulder and say, sit down here, let me, let me show you what happened the last time someone tried this. And if he doesn't want to learn from all there is to learn from, that's recorded about this world's history, what would God do next? This, of course, is not going to happen, but just theoretically, what would God do next? You need to draw aside and think this over. He said, okay, you want, if you want to start the rebellion all over again, I'm going to gather all the people who used to live on planet Earth around, and I'm going to ask them, what do you think I should do? Mm -hmm. And we would just have, we would have two words, I think, to deal with him. He said, stand back. And what happens when God separates himself from us? Cease to exist. We cease to exist. And none of us would fear God, none of us would worry about God, because we know that this person chose that for themselves. Reading on, it would testify that with the existence of God's government and his law is bound up the well-being of all the creatures he has made. Thus, the history of this terrible experiment of rebellion, what do we call that? The great controversy, right? This terrible experiment of rebellion was to be a perpetual safeguard to all holy intelligences to prevent them from being deceived as to the nature of transgression to save them from committing sin and suffering its punishment. Wow. Great Controversy 499. Try another one. Satan's rebellion was to be a lesson to the universe through all coming ages, a perpetual testimony to the nature of sin and its terrible results. The working out of Satan's rule, its effects upon both men and angels, would show that what must be the fruit of setting aside the divine authority. It would testify that with the existence of God's government has bound up the well-being of all the creatures he has made. And you can see this is similar to the one we just read. Mm -hmm. Thus, the history of this terrible experiment of rebellion was to be a perpetual safeguard to all holy beings to prevent them from being deceived as to the nature of transgression to save them from com committing sin and suffering its penalty. Patriarchs and Prophets, also, page 42, paragraph 4. So if, if we are to be changed, we sinful human beings are to be changed from being fully selfish, the condition in which we are born, 
to becoming truly loving the condition in which we'll be able to enter the kingdom of God, how is such a radical change to be brought about? A, a new baby. How much do they care about anybody else? <laughs> Nothing. None. Mm -hmm. All they care about is getting their needs met, right? Mm -hmm. Completely selfish. I mean, that, that's just the way we are. But that's the way they need to be so they could get the attention they need. Okay, so they need it. Yeah. Okay, what about us? Do we need it? No. Not as much. <laughs> Not as much, okay. Well, how's God going to bring about this change? Look at Jeremiah 31. Very interesting. Jeremiah 31, starting with verse 31. The Lord says the time is coming when I will make a new covenant, a new promise, a new agreement with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. What was the problem with that first covenant in Exodus 19 and 24? It was the people promise all that the Lord has said we will do, right? And how long did it last? Just a few oh. days. Few days. Yeah. Well, although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel. Now, who's doing the promising? God. Okay. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord because all will know me. From the least to the greatest, I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Does that sound like a solution? Yes. So if God can just do that, why doesn't he do it to everybody and then he can just save everybody? How about starting with Satan? Just write the law on his heart. If Satan had his chance. Satan had his chance? He, doesn't, he shouldn't get a second chance? Yeah. Well... <laughs> well, he's so damaged less. himself that he's unable to respond positively. Well, he hates his law. Right. Mm -hmm. He hates the law. So why is he ever going to want it to written on his heart? It would be hell for him to have to go to heaven. So, yeah. So who would... Well, how do we get the law written on our hearts? Study. Studying the good old book. Does well, it help to memorize Christ it? Christ said he's going to write it on our hearts. Yeah. Okay, he's going to. Okay. But apparently he's not going to do it to everybody. So how well, do we become not. part of those who get written? Well, you've got to want it for one thing. Okay. I mean, how, if you don't want it, how is he going to be able to do it? What, what, what does it mean to want it? To want it, that means you value it. That means okay. you... Um, you know why it's better than not having it. Okay. There's, um, there's yeah. all kinds of things that would make you draw to that, be drawn to the law, we need to be to, written in your heart. Yeah, we need to reach the place where we actually believe and live as if God's rules, God's laws are for our best good. And that everything he asks us to do is for our own benefit. Now, we might give lip service to that, but a lot of us think, oh, well, hold on, Lord. Stand over there for a moment. I want to do this over here. Now, it seems like when you write it, get it written on your heart, you won't even think about that. Well, and how I does mean, that happen? That's what I'm asking you. How does that happen? You're developing good habits. Mm -hmm. right. you, you actually ask God to come into your life to direct. You make choices on, on his side, choices and choices, until you actually become like him. Would you agree? Um, well, look at some verses. Revelation 20, verse 14. How do you understand this? Then death and the world of the dead were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is a second death. Whoever did not have their names written in the book of the living were thrown into the lake of fire. Okay? How can you throw death into the lake of fire? Can you grab death by the neck and heave him in there? Is it more of a figure of speech? It it's uh, something well, that it was an intruder. It was something it wasn't meant to be. Let's take another verse. Revelation 21, verse 4. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be 
no more death. No more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. How does that happen? No more evil, no more sin. Okay. And no, no more of sin's results, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, would you agree that God cannot do this arbitrarily? Yeah, sure. Death will no longer exist or have power over us because none of us will ever choose to rebel against the only life giver and thus separate ourselves from God. We realize that if we choose to follow Satan's plan, we're basically cutting ourselves off from God. Do we really believe that? When sin is finally eliminated, and with it death and the devil, things will return to their original condition. In other words, what are we saying? We're saying that the lives we're living right now, we are living on life support. We, are, we should be dead because we're sinners. God is keeping us alive for one reason and one reason only, so that we have an opportunity to learn the truth about him and we have the opportunity to make choices in, in his favor against the devil and thus eventually become prepared to enter his kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's think about how it was back in the beginning, way back before sin entered the universe. This is Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 109. But in heaven, service is not rendered in the spirit of legality. When Satan rebelled against the law of Jehovah, the thought that there was a law came to the angels almost as an awakening to something unthought of. In their ministry, the angels are not as servants, but as sons. There is perfect unity between them and their creator. Do you think we could reach the place where we, just, we don't even think of doing anything that's against God? Is that possible? Yes. I think so. This does not mean that God's law will be abolished, as many of our friends would like to suggest. It means that all who enter the kingdom of heaven will have come to realize that God never asks us to do anything which is not for our own best good. We will come to love him and love the way he, his government works so completely that we will never want to rebel again. So if you have a, if you have a group of people in heaven and none of them wants to do anything wrong, how free are they? What does freedom mean? I can do whatever I want, right? If you never want to do anything wrong, then we can have a whole universe full of free people, right? Sure. Nobody wants to do anything wrong. Anything that would hurt somebody else. What is our role in that transformation? And how do we go about being transformed? Satan had claimed that it was impossible for man to obey God's commandments. How was that claim refuted? Christ's life on earth. He lived a perfect life, right? Mm -hmm. And in our own strength, it is true that we cannot obey them. But Christ came in the form of humanity and by his perfect obedience, he proved that humanity and divinity combined can obey every one of God's precepts. Christ's Object Lessons 314, paragraph 4. So how did Christ do it? He obeyed every one of God's precepts. He did it by humanity and divinity combined. So now we know why we can't do it. Jesus was divine, so he had an advantage over us, right? Was it only because of his divinity that Christ was able to keep the law? Well, it might be. Isn't it, isn't it true that when you have the Spirit, you'll receive the divinity? Okay, why do you get the Spirit? Hmm? How do you get the Spirit? You get the Spirit because Making yourself you yourself ask for it. Okay, let me ask you a very, very serious and almost, almost scary question. Is it possible for us to partake of the divinity of Christ? Now? Now. Well, if we follow what he did, I think there's a good chance. He, we know he prayed regularly. He went out every day, every morning. Yeah. 
Okay, it says that by combination, combining his humanity and his divinity, he lived that kind of a life. Do we think there's a group of people living at the end of this earth's history that will be able to keep God's commandments? Yes. Does Satan want us to learn how to keep God's commandments? No. So he will be defeated by a group of people who do this. And that seems to suggest that we may be able to partake of God's divinity somehow. Well, look at this quotation. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. What does that mean? The son of God, that, that should mean we're partaking of divinity, doesn't it? Even to them that believe on his name, John 1, 12. This power is not in the human agent. It is the power of God. Whose power is it? God's power. Is that divinity? Sure. Divinity operating in humanity? Was that on John, 7, John 17, isn't that what that's talking about? Yeah. When a soul receives Christ, he receives power to live the life of Christ. Isn't that divinity in cooperation with humanity? Yeah. Okay. And isn't that, isn't that happening when you ask for the Spirit? When you ask for His Spirit to be with you? Yes. Okay. Okay. So now we come back to something we looked at earlier. God requires perfection of His children. His law is a transcript of His own character, and it is the standard of all character. This infinite standard is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to the kind of people whom God will have to compose his kingdom. The life of Christ on earth was a perfect expression of God's law. And when those who claim to be children of God become Christ-like in character, they will be obedient to God's commandments. Then the Lord can trust them to be of the number who shall compose the family of heaven. We talked about that last week, didn't we? So how does that happen? Doesn't, doesn't say how it happens, though. It says when it happens. Or well, the previous quotation tells us how it happens. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That John received him. The power is not in the human agent. It is the power of God. When a soul receives Christ, he receives power to live the life of Christ. Let's talk about how that happens. Do we know how that happens? You're not going to receive him unless you open your heart to him. Yeah. If we are studying our Bible, if we're thinking about Christ, if we're focusing on him, what we're doing is we're opening up our life and we're saying, Holy Spirit, come in, change my life. Mm -hmm. And who's doing it? Are we doing it? No. The Holy Spirit's doing it. Is that a combination of humanity and divinity? Yes. And if we keep doing that, what happens eventually? It'll be second nature. You'll do it all. We can become like Jesus. We can live lives like what we what he calls here. We become Christ-like in character. Well, it sounds like the Spirit is becoming locked in us. Could we truly live lives like the life of Christ? According to verse 12 of John chapter 1. Yeah. Well, how could you not if you had the Spirit in you? Okay. Is it possible to be transformed by following the example of Jesus? Well, I mean, you know, no I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare way. say this, except that these are words from Ellen White. I'm going to repeat them. He came to the world to display, sometimes we say to demonstrate, right? the glory of God, that man might be uplifted by its restoring power. Whose power is it? God's. God's power. What's supposed to happen to us? Restore us. It's supposed to restore us. Restore us to what? Christ likeness, right? Isn't that, we were made in the image of God. Image of God. So he wants to restore us into the image of God, right? Okay. God was manifested in him that he might be manifested in them. So if God, and this is of course one of your favorite passages, John 17. That's basically what it says there. See? God is manifested in the life of Jesus 
if we study and understand the life of Jesus, then his power can be manifested where? In us. Mm -hmm. In us. Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may, and I would include women here, absolutely, may not have through, may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity is that perfect, no, notice, his perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if they will be in subjection to God as he was. Now, how does that strike you? That's pretty bold. Pretty, pretty incredible, isn't it? Really. So, let's think about that now. What Jesus is saying to us is this, I want to be your partner. John 15, 15, what does it say? I want to be your friend. I want, to have, I want to have this faith relationship with you. And if we can learn to walk together with Christ beside us, what happens? We become more and more like him. So let's move down a few paragraphs. Desire of Ages, page 668. All true obedience comes from the heart. In other words, it's, it's not, you don't put on a shell outside like the Pharisees and say, I'm going to do this if it kills me. I don't want to. Paul, what did Paul say in Romans 7? I don't, I don't like the things I do. I mean, in, inside, I, I, you know, I have this desire to do right, but I just can't do it. No, not, that's not the way it works. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ. If we will consent... He will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. What are, the, what are our own impulses? Mm -hmm. Now? Now I'm talking about what they should be. Oh, to follow God, to yeah, obey well, God. Basically, we do things by impulse, don't we? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things we do by impulse are wrong. And so Christ says what? If you have this kind of a relationship with me, those impulses will be the right, thing. the right things. You won't even want to do, remember what we said a few moments ago? You won't even want to do anything wrong. Sounds like his impulses mm -hmm. will become our impulses. Yes. The will, refined and sanctified, I'm reading on, will find its highest delight in doing his service. Is this going to be drudgery? No. no. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him. So what's the, what's the solution to all this? Forget Getting to really know God. Jim, you want to quote John 17, 3? The eternal life is to know the Father and the Son. Yeah. That's, that's a paraphrase of Right it, there. Yeah. This is life eternal, to know thee, the King James says, to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So the key to eternal life is getting to know the truth about God in detail. If I'm going to read that sentence again. The will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God, as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience through an appreciation of the character of Christ through communion with God sin will become hateful to us. Desire of Ages 668.3 You might want to look that up. You might think there's no way that could be true. In life of continual obedience and of continual obedience is taking instruction and we're going to learn for eternity. Mm -hmm. And we're going to learn from the infinite one. Yeah. I mean, what, what else, what, what could compare to that? How could you ask for a better teacher? Yeah. 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 Now, how fast can this spirit come? How fast can you say yes? Well, will it come if I say yes? If you really mean it, yes. So I will, I will do exactly what that is describing well, just as soon as that happens? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about faith here. Yeah. Sarah was pretty well tested by her faith. She knew the promise that she was going to have her child. And but yet God, it took a while for it to happen. 
So, so could that happen with some other people as far as those great descriptions happening to them, but they still have to, I mean, they can still hold on to the faith even though they're not, they're not exactly performing like described there. Do you remember what Sarah did when God came to visit their place? God said, nine months from now I'm coming back and you'll have a baby. And Sarah laughed at her. And God says, D did you laugh at me? And Sarah said, no, I didn't laugh at you. <laughs> and God said, name the boy Laughter. So you're saying, you're <laughs> saying that she didn't really have the faith? I'm asking you, what, what's going on there? Well, I think she did have faith, um, she but it faith. took a while. It took a while to happen. In fact, she was nervous about it. She says, I'm going to bring my handmaid, Hagar, and you have a child with her. It must be what God wants because I'm getting old. Yeah. So um, I think Sarah laughed because she couldn't help herself. It was, the idea was so incredible. She just, yeah. I mean, you know. We laugh because something unusual, unexpected happens. But, but the point I'm trying to get at yeah, no, is, is this fast. It, it, how fast is it guaranteed to happen? Every time you say yes to God, it, it gets a little closer. It gets a little more. It, it's not, it doesn't you say once yes, okay. This is not a once saved, always saved kind of a deal. It's got to be constant. It means every day you make a decision for God. And you would say yes, 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 yes. And as you do that, God says, okay, every day you give me a chance, I'll do a little more work. So it's a little more, a little more, a little more. And that process is called sanctification. Mm -hmm. Think of all the things that people are working for on our earth today. <laughs> what, are the, what are the ultimate goals of, here in this world? Fame, money, political power, uh, we could name others. How many of these things will persist in the world to come? None of them. You heard the, the parable. This is a false story, but it's a funny story. Mm -hmm. You heard the parable about the man Well, heard, that heard a rumor that had come down from heaven saying, whatever you can bring to heaven in one suitcase, you'll be allowed to bring. And boy, he started collecting money. He said, man, I... I'll, I'll, I'll save a lot of money. And then he realized, you know, if I have all this U.S. money in my suitcase, it may not be recognized in heaven. I better save something that has permanent value. I'm going to save gold, gold bars. So he bought all the gold he could get his hands on. He stuffed it in his suitcase. And when he died, he showed up at St. You know, the traditional St. Peter's at the pretty gate. He shows up at the pretty gate with his, his, his suitcase full of gold, and he can just barely lift it. He says, man... He says, I am ready for this place. And Peter says, what do you got in your suitcase? <laughs> He'll open up, look, look at all this gold. And Peter says, why did you want to bring all that pavement up here for? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, I mean, isn't that the, isn't that the story, right? <laughs> so, by living the perfect life he, that he lived and dying the terrible death that he died, Jesus demonstrated once and for all the truth about God. His law, his government, and, contra and his law and his government in contrast to Satan's falsehoods. So, the thing which we need to learn is the truth. Who is telling us the truth, right? We have a choice. We can, one, follow his life to the best of our ability with the help of the Holy Spirit and live forever. Or two, live the selfish lives which come so naturally to us and then die the death which he died, which is the second death. Do we understand all those issues that are involved? So many Christians focus their attention on the initial steps in the Christian life. Now, that's not bad. What are the first steps in a Christian life? That's the first steps? Yeah. That's saying, yes, I, I agree. I, I want to change. I want to be different. I, I want to be baptized, right? Those are the first steps in a Christian life. And those are good. There's nothing wrong with them. But it's not the whole story. We need to move beyond those initial steps and practice living a Christ-like life. 
Could we truly reach the place where sin would be hate, become hateful to us? Do you, do, you know, do you have any friends for whom sin is hateful? Thought about it? Do you think to you is sin hateful? Are we accessing the divine power which is available to us to live Christ-like lives? That was your question, Gary. Are we accessing that power? Do our neighbors and friends realize that we are different because of our Christianity? Satan rebelled in heaven because of envy and jealousy. He wanted to be in a plane equal with God or better yet, to be over God. We know the story. When he was cast down to this earth and spoke to Eve through the serpent in the tree, we see, and I'm quoting from a book by Sigby Tonstedt, we see misrepresentation turning into distrust, distrust maturing into alienation, and alienation ripening into fear. You can read that in Sigby Tonstadt's book, The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day. Think about that sequence. Let's look at that for just a moment. It, maybe if we could look a little bit about how the fall happened, we can understand a little bit about what we needed to go back. Now the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord God had made. The snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. The snake replied, that's not true. So how did sin get started on this in, in the Garden of Eden? Why? With a lie. A misrepresentation about God. So how are we going to solve the problem? Learning the truth about God, right? It was deception. It was deception. He tells a lie, but he sugarcoats it with some truth. Mm -hmm. He says, you, if, you, you, if you eat of it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's true. Well, knowing good, yeah. It's true, because you finish the, down toward the end of chapter 3, and it says, now man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get him to take the cyanide capsule, which is deadly, mm -hmm. you sugarcoat it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Simple. Yeah. The woman saw how beautiful the tree was and how good its fruit would be to eat, and she thought how wonderful it would be to become wise. I mean, don't we have a song? Be like Jesus. This is my song. In the day, in the... You know, every day in the throng. So she took some other fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband and he also ate it. As soon as they had eaten it, they were given understanding. And what are they now understanding? Good and evil. Evil. And realized that they understood good before. Yeah, well, but and realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and covered themselves. So when we look at how sin originated in our world, we get an idea of what we need to do to, 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 to undo that problem. In light of all this, shouldn't God have foreseen this terrible emergency and prevented it? This earth was created to answer questions that the intelligences in heaven still had. Okay. And they had to see how evil works and over and over and over through thousands of or hundreds of generations. Was our plan of redemption an afterthought just a response to Satan's rebellion? And I quote, the plan for our redemption was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was an unfolding of the principles. What are the principles of God's government? Love, right? The principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. From the beginning, God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan and of the fall of man through the deceptive power of the apostate. God did not ordain that sin should exist, but he foresaw its existence and made provision to meet the terrible emergency. Desire of Ages 22, paragraph 2. Did he know? Did he know in advance? That's one of the attributes. God has Absolutely. the capacity to know the future. Absolutely. We talked earlier about, does God change? We have presented some very stark contrasts in this lesson, human beings living a Christ-like life in contrast to Satan's envy and jealousy leading to his downfall and the great controversy. On which side of that great controversy do you want to be? 
on the right side, God's side. God is offering a great retirement plan out of this world, a retirement plan that's out of this world. And what do we have to do? Yes. Gary, that was your question. What do we have to do? Ask for his, for him. Every day say yes. yes. What did the quotation say? By allowing the Holy Spirit to come in, we can be so changed, so transformed, that we can live Christ-like lives, and sin will become what? It's Hateful to us. What? We, it's, it's almost... It, I don't know, it, it's hard for us to even imagine a life lived where sin is hateful to us. Desire of Ages later on was talking about the childhood of Christ. It says, it, just for Jesus to watch somebody committing a sin was painful to him. And probably what was even more painful is to watch the priests and the... Yeah. And the, the scribes and Pharisees doing their thing and misrepresenting God in their... Yeah. As wow. many preachers today probably paint him. Yeah. So how does God feel about all that? And, and let's just be honest now. Do we understand in light of all this why it's only these kind of people, the ones who, who really want to do God's will, why those are the only people that it's safe for God to admit to heaven? We don't want to start the whole mess all over again. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like, it's like readmitting Lucifer to heaven. Okay. So it's not an arbitrary thing. God is not arbitrary. He says, well, I like the color of your hair. I don't like the, you know, I don't like the length of your nose. I mean, some crazy thing. God doesn't do that. He said, the only people that it's safe for me to admit to heaven are the ones who don't even want to do anything wrong. If you don't even want to do anything wrong, then welcome to the kingdom. And how do we get like that? We start practicing now. Day by day, we open our lives, we open our minds, we open our hearts to God, and we say, come in, teach me about you. The knowledge we need is very specifically the knowledge about God, about his character, and about his life, and the kind of life he lived when he's here on this earth. If we can learn that, and learn to love that, we're home. I hope you've enjoyed this series of lessons as we have.